English, German, Spanish, Russian, Farsi, Hindi, these and many others all fall into the Indo-European language family, with its common ancestor being Proto-Indo-European. Proto-Indo-European, or just PIE for short, was first proposed all the way back in the mists of 1786 by a man called Sir William Jones. He had studied classical Latin and ancient Greek when he was younger, and when he was sent to India on a business trip, he decided to learn a local ancient language, which in his case was Sanskrit. When he, when he learned Sanskrit, he, re, uh, he noticed some surprising similarities between the three ancient languages he had learned, and he thought that it could only be explained by a common ancestor which all three languages were descended from. He also then included Gothic, Celtic, and Old Persian to his list for this ancient language. He basically began modern linguistics. Th this is where it all began. The term Indo-European itself, though, was added much later, as in 1813. And it simply means common language of India and Europe. It, it's a pretty self-explanatory name. Um, that, were, that are related, of course. Both continents have languages that do not fall under Indo-European. Um, <clears throat> so William Jones came up with this theory, but he actually never did any reconstruction. That was left to other people to do, to actually create his dream. I don't even know if he really, how much he even loved the project. Um, but the two people to start work on it were Franz Bopp, who started work in 1833, and August Schleicher. I think I just pronounced that pretty badly for the second one, sorry. And further professionals have, of course, carried on the work. In fact, the last major updated language was only two years ago, in 2013. The 2013 reconstruction listed around 1,200 words as reconstructable words that used to be in Proto-Indo-European, as well as 31 phonemes in total. They were Aba, 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 Ada, 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 Akya, Agya, Agya, Aga, 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 Agua, Agua, Agua. If you can't tell the difference between the first row and second row there, uh, the difference is voicing, but because English aspirates as unvoiced consonants anyway, it's actually even harder to tell the difference when they're not aspirated. So I voiced the second row but didn't aspirate the first row, so it might be a little difficult. As for the third row, they are aspirated, so I won't blame you if you can't tell the difference either there. The further phonemes were asa. Aha, ala, awa, aya, and now onto the nasals. Ama, ana, anga, and now the five vowels that are reconstructed. E, a, o, u, and e. All of these vowels have two versions: a long version and a short version. And u and e weren't real vowels; they were just allophones of of awa and aya, respectively. And then there's three more sounds, because I've only done 28 of them. These three, I have actually left as they are normally written in Indo-European, because Indo-European doesn't actually use IPA most of the time for its writing. The reason I've done this is because there isn't actually a huge amount of agreement on what these three sounds actually were, because only one of the descendant languages kept them. And that uses a sort of semi-pictographic style of writing, so it's a bit hard to tell what the sound is when you're just drawing pictures. So there are theories, of course, because although only one descendant has kept them, all the other descendants show signs of them existing, and different sounds do different things. So this one has been identified as either a a. If you can't tell the difference there, just listen very carefully to the difference between the two vowels because the sound itself is silent, or aha, which is the English H sound, basically. The second one could have been aha, 
a a or a ha the third sound out of that set which is a little more notable as there are three other sounds these three and it's generally accepted that they are vela but there are some people that think it might actually be uvela rather than vela because the language is certainly reconstructed with them a long way back in the vela position and if they are in fact uvela then the sound I just said before, the third one for the second H, would actually come in line as a balanced for phoneme for the uvelas. But this uvela theory isn't very widely accepted, so H2 could be the only uvela in the entire language. As for H3, this is quite easy. It could have been achwa or achwa, which quite easily fits with the rest of the language, considering we already have three labial vela stop consonants. From the really quite extensive reconstruction they've done on Indo-European, considering that they have had 200 years on it, um, linguists have tried writing sample texts of their reconstructed languages, versions of the language rather, which, as a kind of way to sort of show what kind of things are possible with what they've constructed. Uh, I am going to try reading one of these texts. This is me reading The King and the God. Chrekios Gewos Gwe Chrekios Hest So Nepotlos Chrekios Suchten Wulnchto Tosio Gechwetorm Prekiest Suchnus Moyi Ginchietod Gechweto Tom Chrekim Webket Hayekieswo Diawom Wernom Se sole nu dia wom hege gieto, kiliu ti moi pita werune. Dia was werunos diwes gumta guacht, quid welsi, suchnum welmi. Tod hestu, welket luecos dia was werunos. Nu chrekius pot nich suchnum gegionhe. With around one thousand two hundred words, and enough reconstructed work to make that story and these words include other things like snow, farming techniques, crops that you can grow, animals and even nearly a hundred words for homicide. You must all be asking why haven't archaeologists gone looking for the actual culture that spoke Proto-Indo-European? Some people certainly have tried it is very difficult though, as there are up to six different theories on where and when Proto-Indo-European was actually spoken. By far the leading hypothesis puts the Proto-Indo-European speakers on the Caspian Pontic steppe around 6,000 years ago, which is about as old as the pyramids. And this is one of the younger theories, by the way, I, as in when Proteinu has spoken, that is not. It's a recent series, uh, recent theory. It's actually one of the oldest theories come up with for the homeland. The other main theory is the Anatolian hypothesis, which puts Protein Europeans in Anatolia around 8,000 years ago. Generally, though, the Kurgan hypothesis comes out on top. <coughs> so, using the Kurgan hypo hypothesis as our benchmark, who is the most likely archaeological culture to speak Proto-Indo-European? Well, the best bet out there is probably the Khavlyinsk culture, which is known for its community graves, ceremonial weapons, jewellery made from mostly animal bone, and bronze tools. This actually lines up incredibly well with Proto-Indo-European vocabulary, which had words for Ayoses, Nises, Ikes, and as well as the concept that animals define a person's wealth. The most important point, though, for matching up the Kavliens culture with the Proto-Indo-Europeans is that both existed at around the same time in the same place, which is something you sort of need if you want to say, oh, these two things are the same. Earlier on in the video, I touched on the various descendants of Proto-Indo-European. But of course, they have to come from somewhere. This tree didn't make itself, obviously. 
Well, first of all, you have to take it into several stages, because no language becomes all of its descendants instantly. The language actually first broke up into 18 different branches, which then divided up further into its the hundreds of modern varieties of Indo-European. These 18 branches are Germanic, Celtic, Lusitanian, Italic, Venetic, Misapic, Illyrian, Thracian, Albanian, Ancient Macedonian, Dacian, Greek, Phrygian, Anatolian, Balto-Slavic, Armenian, Indo-Iranian, and Tocharian. Of course, not all of these languages exist anymore. In fact, none of them do. All the branches have broken up further into descendants, and some of them have died out altogether. As a small example of how much some of these branches changed right off the bat, or even how much they didn't change, I am going to concentrate on these nine phonemes, the velas, as well as this one word, Kuraigya. And I'm going to map out for you how each branch changed these sounds and what their version of the word would be. Germanic is what is known as a Kentum language. It's an old term in Indo-European. It basically says, out of the three sets of fellow consonants, the palatals, the planes, and the labials, it, the Kentum, or its counterpart, Setem, tells linguists whether the language merges palatals or its labials with its planes. Because all of them, with the exception of one, lost one of these sets. The terms themselves are worth 100, one from a Kenton dialect and one from a Setan dialect. But anyway, Germanic, obviously, being Kenton, merged its plateaus with its planes, but then it changed pronunciations of all three rows as well. So, the aspirates at the bottom lost their aspiration, so they became Aga and Agua. The voice lost their voicing, they became Agua and Aga. And the unvoiced ones became fricatives, they just vanished altogether, stop consonants. They become acha and achwa. And our word originally has now become Greek. Celtic, though, did something even stranger. It's it's actually less organized. We we have again plateaus merge, and then we have the loss of aspiration, and then the various labial sounds start doing weird things as well. The ag agua basically merges with its with the plane as well, so the entire bottom row has become aga, but agua that wasn't aspirated originally has become aba. Uh, so you get two sounds for the second row, you get aga and or aba. The top row is pretty organised, that's just agua and ag aga. So this leaves us with a strange situation that the original word has now become brig. Maybe we'll have better luck with the next branch. Italic. Okay, we do have better luck with the next branch. In this case, you, again, this is in fact where the word Kentum comes from. It comes from the Italic branch of the language. So this is definitely Kentum branch. The plateaus, again, merged with planes. So it gives us, on the top row, Aga and Agua. On the second row, we get Aga and Agua. But the third row actually devoiced and then became fricatives. So they become... Acha and Achwa, which gives us a strange situation now that Germanic Acha sounds and Italic Acha sounds don't line up with each other. They are, in fact, on opposite ends of the section. And our original word becomes Greek. So I guess that one you can almost still hear the original, really. Next, we have Venetic. This is, again, another Kentum dialect. So, again, plateaus merge with planes. And then you have the usual aspirate loss and all that stuff. But the labials, again, do something rather odd in this case. Agua becomes kv. Ba basically, it splits into two sounds. It becomes k and v. Agua becomes awa. It, it just becomes a w. And aqua becomes afa. It becomes an F somehow. Somehow. And our word has become unrecognisable. It is Vrik. Next up, we have Dacian, our first Saturn dialect. And this one means that the labials merged with the planes. 
and then you have the usual loss of aspiration. Well, that leaves us with atta and aza, as well as aka and aga. And a word becomes greids. Greek is the first one to actually go a little insane. If you can really use insane for language shift, I, I'm not sure if you can even do that. Well, it is a kentum, so the plateau is merged with velas. The aspirated column actually devoices, it doesn't merge, it becomes aspirated devoice. So you, and then we have the labials. They are where the insanity starts. Depending on what the following sound is, depends on what they've actually become. But in general, agua become abba, agua becomes abba, and agua becomes apa. As well as having aga and aga with the f new set of aspirates being aka. And this leaves us with a word very similar to the Celtic one, braig. So, next, Thraigian, well, this is again setem. We're, we're going to certainly get more and more setems from this point on because we've covered most of the Kentum dialects now. <coughs> this one we have. It's pretty standard actually. It has labials merged with the planes, aspirates are lost, leaving us with atza, aga, adza, and aga, and the word graids, which I am quite sure is identical to Dacian, our first Setem dialect. Anatolian. This is this is really definitely the easiest one of the lot. Nothing changes. So we've still got the original nine, and the word is still graigia. Bauto Slavic next. Again, this is setem, but this one is an interesting setem because it doesn't frictivize itself. It actually just frictivizes itself with the first set of stop consonants. So first we have aspirate loss and labials merge with plain. Leave, uh, but then we have the frictivization of the plateaus, leaving us with asya, aja, aga, and aga. I, th I think it's sort of become a sort of pattern that on a whole these nine sounds tend to turn into four. Four, possibly five sounds, usually. Armenian is our next one. This is, again, a slightly non-standard one. It is also, again, setem. In fact, we've only got one Kenton branch left in the whole language that we haven't covered. This one, we have everything shifts downwards, I guess. This one, you can actually say everything shifts down a row. So, the aspirates lose their aspiration. So, we get Adza and aga. The voiced looser voicing, so we get adza and aga. And the top row actually becomes aspirated, with the exception of the plateau, which frictivizes itself, so it becomes asa and aka, which leaves us with the word greets, which is really quite unrecognizable from the original kreigia. <coughs> Indo Iranian, this is definitely setem, this is the branch where the word satem comes from. And it's also our first branch outside Europe. Well, unless you count Anatolian, but that's an interesting case. Do you count Turkey and Anatolia as being European or Middle Eastern? I, I won't go on to politics. <coughs> so this one, though, just because it's where Satem comes from doesn't mean it's particularly standard. It doesn't lose its aspirates either. That's another interesting point. <coughs> It, get, it, it gives us asha, aga, aja, aga, as well as aja and aga. And it also leaves us with the word graij. Yes, vowel changes. This one has an interesting set of vowel changes, but it's nothing compared with what we've got next. Finally, by far the most eastern branch of the entire Indo European family and one that doesn't exist anymore. In fact, where it exists is now modern-day China, Tocharian. This branch went a little cuckoo, and this time I really do mean a bit insane with its sound shifts. It is, in fact, Kentum. So it merged its palatals with its planes. But then it went on a massive um, crusade of devoicing all its sounds, which means it actually lost too many sounds, so it went through the, the sort of fail-safe languages have, which is to not lose too many sounds. So the top row, the original unvoiced, actually become platelized, so you end up with 
platels again. So we end up with this set of aqua, aqua, aquia, and aqua. And just to make things worse, it went on a vowel deletion and changes, which gives us this final word of gubriaik, which I'm not even sure if an Indo-European, an original one, would recognise that word, considering that they said Gbraigia. I, I wonder which word has changed the least and the most. Well, obviously, Anatolian has the one that's changed the least, is still Gbraigia. But out of words like Brig, Brig and Kriai, I, I wonder which one has changed the most. M maybe you could tell me what you think has changed the most. And now, let's totally reverse it. We go from descendants to ancestors. Just like people have taken languages of the world and created these proto-languages out of it, which is exactly what Proto-Indo-European is, some people have then gone on and take proto-languages and create even older proto-languages. Basically taking two or more reconstructed languages and trying to create its ancestor. So what does Proto-Indo-European have? Well, it has no generally accepted ancestors currently because it's so different to other language uh, other proto language but people have still tried by far the most accepted connection is with the uralic family in the proposed proto indo uralic language in fact this proposal has sort of polarized the linguistical community it has a strange situation where half the field says yes it exists. And half the field says, no, it can't possibly exist. And these few poor souls sit in the middle of this giant war going on, which has sort of quieted down lately, but it still very much exists. Beyond that, there are also two more proposals, Eurasiatic and Nostratic. These are often considered fringe signs and fraudulous, so they definitely don't have much in the way of support. I might do a video on all three eventually. Anyway, that concludes part one of this video. Join me in part two, where I will actually concentrate more on the society and the culture of the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European peons, as shown by the language. I will also borrow a little from the Kravlyins culture and how they lived their lives to create this overall pictures of what the Proto-Indo-Europeans might have been.